actually am a big believer in equality. It's just I believe in equality of opportunity where the rules of the game and the game are open to everyone to enter. Doesn't mean everybody starts from the same position. Doesn't mean everybody ends up at the same spot, but that folks can enter. Technology, whether it's AI or the computer or radio, ends up being a tool mm -hmm. that humans can use to take action. And as long as we keep that in mind, that in fact these are things that are going to be used by real people in the marketplace, and we understand them from that perspective, they can be a great boon to human innovation and productivity across time. I can think of few organizations less equipped to solve complex problems across time than a government. And so what we end up with is nations that come together, they sign accords, they make agreements, claim they're going to do something, and then very little actually happens. Inconformes con el Dr. Jorge Díaz Cuervo. This episode was recorded in English. Ryan M. Young is the Director of Educational Programs at the American Institute for Economic Research. He holds a PhD from Georgia State University. Prior to joining the Institute, he held academic positions at North Dakota State University, Utah State University, and Southern Utah University, and was one of the founders of the Strata Policy. He's the co-author and editor of numerous books, including Green vs. Green, Nature Unbound, Bureaucracy vs. the Environment, The Reality of American Energy and Politics, and Quality of Life, The Role of Well-Being in Political Outcomes. His research explores how policy can be better crafted to achieve greater individual autonomy and prosperity. Ryan, thank you and welcome. Uh, thank you for having We're me. It's great to be here. To have you here at Universidad de la Libertad. Absolutely. I'm delighted to be here with you all this week. Why don't we start um, by you telling us a little bit about um, the Institute, the American Institute for Economic Research. Absolutely. So uh, the American Institute for Economic Research, we call it AIER uh, in the short, uh, has been around since the 1930s, actively working to better understand both economics and how uh, government intervention into the economy really messes up the outcomes that we sort of see. And we're rooted in a tradition of liberalism uh, that we call classical liberalism, where both both freedom of individuals and freedom to operate in the market are essential for human prosperity. And that was the vision of our founder, uh, E.C. Harwood, in the 1930s, pushing back against um, the New Deal and the Roosevelt administration. And it continues to be what we care deeply about today, working on a variety of issues that remain relevant um, right to today. You have been uh, critical of government intervention. In oh, yes. What do you think should be the role of government versus the role of markets so that we can achieve um, economic growth, successful economic growth? Yeah, so the, the good news is we actually know a whole bunch about that empirically. And then we also have a good foundation in theory uh, and understanding of what the proper role of government looks like. Because in many ways for a market to, for, to work, it needs to have property rights that are existent. Um, and that's a role where government actually can play um, pretty pretty well. It sets the rights, and then it can be the adjudicator when disputes arise. And so those two sort of key aspects um, really are where government tends to do, do things well, um, or relatively well. It doesn't always do them perfectly, but it does them better uh, than lots of the other stuff it tries. Where government gets into trouble uh, is when it tries to decide what people should want, what they should produce, what they should buy, what they should sell, when it tries to really manage the economy, uh, then we start to get all sorts of problems that emerge because it's not just that government is a single entity. It's a collection of people with their own interests trying to achieve those preferences, and they're using the mechanism of government, which has force behind it, to try to push people to do it. And so government in sort of its limited role, protecting property rights, acting as an adjudicator, ensuring rule of law, becomes really where government can allow for markets to really flourish and develop. But it seems that um, governments always want to to become business people and they want to create enterprises and companies. And uh, here in Mexico, now our government just created an airline. Um, they're distributing uh, pharmaceuticals. Uh, obviously, we have Pemex and we have, uh, you know, the company that uh, gives us power. I mean, 
in Mexico, we have a government that's uh, that it's a it's a player in the market. Yeah. Um, how do you think we should um, walk backwards? I mean, how how can we end uh, that intervention in, in in the market? So so I'm a I'm I'm a fairly I'm fairly radical in this regard because uh, anytime you have um, someone restricting trade, whether it's government entering the marketplace and trying to provide services that are that a private entity could, or where someone tries to prevent someone else from entering through tariffs or regulation, what's happening is not that they're doing some great good for For the people, they're actually costing consumers who have to buy and sell in the marketplace substantially. And so when you have a government airline or a government petrochemical company, what's happening is there's not the competition that then drives innovation and ultimately either leads to improvements in the products that people get or lowering of price because the selection is being made not through a market of competition, but rather through decisions made by those ultimately that are elected and that have their own individual agendas about what they want the world to look like. So instead of it being us all together through the propensity we have to truck, barter, and trade, as Adam Smith said, uh, making the decisions. It's individuals who gain political power that ultimately end up having it. And so to do that, you, it's figuring out how do you help people see the cost that these things impose over the long run, and then pushing for the pol for politics to then pull out of those areas. It's not easy. I'm not super optimistic that it's going to happen quickly or efficiently, but really helping people understand the cost of that intervention, I think, is was the major way you can start to roll it. Sure, down. and um, and also I think I don't know if you agree with me, but the the significance, the meaning of the words are important. Yeah. For example, um, in Mexico and in many countries in Latin America, the concept of equality or inequality, I think, has been used uh, politically. Yeah, uh, in, in a very populist way, um, to try to solve um, this, I mean, situation where we have people that are very wealthy and people that are very poor. Yeah, uh, and they sell the possibility of of, of, of attaining a more uh, equality between between our our, our societies. Um, And we're not equal. I mean, as individuals, we're each of us is independent. Yeah. It's unique. Yeah, we, we all are unique. And, and one of the major issues I think that comes up when we talk about equality, because I actually am a big believer in equality. It's just I believe in equality of opportunity where the rules of the game and the game are open to everyone to enter. Doesn't mean everybody starts from the same position. Doesn't mean everybody ends up at the same spot, but that folks can enter. And if you look at the major sort of stories that we uh, we sort of idealize and look up to many of those are folks that had they not been able to enter the market enter the arena would never have been able to become truly great and what uh, equality as it's typically used by populists from both the left and the right actually this comes from both sides uh, does is it says well we're going to either restrict how you can come in or we're going to say This is how it has to end up. And as a result, we end up greatly limiting the whole scope of human achievement by saying, we know what's we know what's right for people to start at, or we know where it's right for people to end up. And as a result, we miss out on a whole tremendous amount of the innovation and growth that people could have. People will end up with different out different resources. People will end up achieving different things. But as we create an openness to allow people to work for their own interests, to set them up that way, to remove barriers then they're able to start to work to achieve as much as is possible for them. Yeah. And that's really the, the society I want to live in, not one where government says everybody has to start at the same place and everybody has to end at the same place. Exactly. Uh, so which are the critical factors that you could uh, point out that you think that contribute to individual autonomy and prosperity? Yeah, so I think there are, there are really a couple of major ones. One is that equality of opportunity that I talked about. That is when there are things that are preventing people by law. So when, when law says you can't do this because of who you are, those are things that we should repeal and, and, and pull back. And so uh, allowing that opportunity, that equality of opportunity uh, to be widespread, I think is the top one. And the second is that we do have rule of law, that in fact, there is a consistent application of the law. Um, law should be fairly minimal. They should be designed to prevent violence and to ensure that contracts are enforced and that people are treated in accordance with a respect for human basic human dignity. But ultimately, that's 
um, where it ends. It's not that we're trying to try to figure out exactly what people should do. And then on top of that, freeing them through those two things to then go out and do and achieve, uh, I think ends up creating more prosperity than anything else. And really, my view of the world is one where we free human innovation and spirit, removing many of the restrictions that are artificially created will do more than any program that seeks to equalize something ever could. If you free people to do good, and to work for themselves, and they'll achieve great things. And that takes me to, um, to state, and I believe in that, I, I, my major is in economics, is that uh, human action mm -hmm. is what really drives yeah. the economy. Uh, we're not machines, we're not computers. Um, so economy is not a, it's not a science, it's yeah. not a natural science, it's a, it's a human, it's a social science. It's a social science. Um, so um, how do you think that artificial intelligence or blockchain, all these changes we're, we're, we're watching, Uh, will impact uh, policy, public policy, or our economic system? So I, I'm sure they will. I don't know exactly what it is, and it would be, as Hayek said, the pretense of knowledge for me to assume that I can know exactly how it will affect. But there are a couple of principles in technological development that I think um, are important that we keep in mind. And the first is every technological innovation has been claimed by some to be world-ending, whether it was the inv invention of radio or television or computing or the internet. There's always this belief that somehow it's going to change and ruin everything. It's not been true in the past. It's not likely to be true in the future. Technology, whether it's AI or the computer or radio, ends up being a tool mm -hmm. that humans can use to take action. And as long as we keep that in mind, that in fact, these are things that are going to be used by real people in the marketplace, and we understand them from that perspective, they can be a great boon to human innovation and productivity across time. But we can also fall into the trap of saying, ah, oh, We're going to be able to harness this to get what we want and force others to do what we want. And that's really, I think, where one of the major risk points are, is when we empower uh, particularly government, but also uh, non-governmental entities that somehow manage to get a monopoly on force to use them in, in a particular way, then we run the risk of them being problematic. But ultimately, I'm a big believer that AI and these sort of things have huge potential to make Uh, humanity better off in the long run. doesn't come without risk, doesn't come without problems, but it's a tool. And it's a tool that as we learn how to use it and start to work with it, there's huge potential. I'm, I'm a fundamental believer in the, the, the enormous upside of human potential. And we, as we learn to use these things and engage with them and don't believe that we understand everything from the beginning or force people to use them in a certain way, it's amazing what humanity can do. Yeah, so, so we're watching this technology that's driving us together, is pulling us together as, as, as humans. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, in different regions of the world, um, in your country, yeah. in my country, there's this rise, race of um, nationalisms yep. and um, identitary um, reivindications that are pulling us apart. Yeah. And th this is where my hardcore sort of libertarian streak will come out because mm -hmm. imagine a world in which government was not empowered to do many of the things it does today. The fights in those identitarian politics or that populism, that competition over the resources of the state. Uh, if the state is doing very little, doing just those basic things, protecting individual rights, rule of law, enforcing property rights, there's not a lot of spoils to fight over. And that's what a lot of the sort of coming apart comes to. Folks want to use the state to be able to enforce their preferences on other people. If government isn't able to do that, if we live in a world where that's not occurring, many of those things start to fade from the square and folks then have to engage in trade or discussion or some other mechanism to resolve it. Again, it won't always be perfect. It won't always be pretty. It won't always be necessarily peaceful. But right now, lots of those things are coming about because of the wide scope of things government does. And we we could reduce those things dramatically by, by limiting what government actually is involved in and pushing the onus back on individuals to interact with one another to solve solutions. Um, right, and you've, you've written a lot about um, environmental sustainability. I, have. I know that worries you. Um, where do you think are the biggest challenges we're facing? So uh, I think we have two, I think we have two major challenges in environmental and sustainability. Uh, the first is the status quo bias problem. And that is that we have an image of what we think the right technologies are or the right approaches to solving environmental problems are. They're not working. They haven't worked to achieve the things we want over the last 40 years. And so 
we get stuck on that we're going to keep applying the same thing over and over again. So if it, it, we're going to do more of this and that'll somehow make it better, that's not working. And so the problem is how do we then get innovators and entrepreneurs into the mix to actually come up with new things. I was just on a call right before we sat down to chat about this very issue with some folks that are interested in how do you engage that process. And what they're finding is that status quo bias makes it hard for them to experiment or to actually deploy. So that's the first one, that we're stuck in a status quo. And the second is that folks really have come to believe that the solution exists with government, that somehow government will be able to do the coordinating mechanism necessary to solve these problems. I, I can think of few organizations less equipped to solve complex problems across time than a government. And so what we end up with is nations that come together, they sign accords, they make agreements, claim they're gonna do something, and then very little actually happens. If you wanna make real change, it's in the garage of the crazy engineer, it's in the entrepreneur's office, it's in individual people understanding what it is they want, that's what can really drive change. And if you watch, you'll see lots of folks that care deeply about the environment working to do those things. So be op being open to those changes, I think, is one of the major ways. Again, we face real environmental problems, um, whether it's uh, global warming, which I don't know what the end result is or how to fix it, but it's certainly something on the table. Uh, clean air and water around the world are all problems that, that remain. And we've typically kept applying the same solution more regulation, more restriction, and we get the same sort of outcomes where real solutions to those problems come about through the crazy guy in his garage coming up with a new way to do something that works both environmentally and economically. Because if it do doesn't work economically, it, it just won't happen. Would you agree that what we need is freedom to innovate, uh, to um, get be more competitive in the market, and then the result would be prosperity. Yeah, there, there are very few times when my answer to how do we make human beings better off isn't freedom. Um, that is, I think, at the core the, of understanding how do human beings prosper is when individuals are able to plan for themselves, take action to achieve their preferences, they tend to, to succeed the best. And the way we work things out together is we do have some basic rules of the game. We want people to be prudential. So there is prudence alongside freedom, but ultimately... Freedom is what drives uh, the human capacity to achieve. Yeah, like um, I think it was Roosevelt who said, um, freedom is an opportunity to self-control, yes. to self-govern. Yes, yourself. and if only he'd believed that and <laughs> instead of implementing a massive state that then tried to control. Exactly. Um, but no, that's ultimately what it is. And as we, as we think about those things, we often worry about the one person that will deviate. And how do we, can, how do we stop that deviation from happening? Well, that leaves the other 99 um, that are now unable to take the achievement and means exactly. we lose out on a lot of potential prosperity. And that's really, I think, where environmentally we've ended up is we're worried about stopping the one from doing something. And it means that we're now, we stop the other 99 from doing incredible things. Exactly. Well, Ryan, thank you very Absolutely. much for visiting Universidad de la Libertad. Yeah, I'm very happy to be here. Thank you. Thank you. Inconformes es producido en la Universidad de la Libertad. 